In this section, we will focus on visual methods for explainability in the context of deep learning. Given that this is a vast topic, it's not possible to cover all major subjects. That said, we will try to cover some major techniques which are used in this area. So before talking about individual techniques, we would like to highlight an interesting results from a now classical paper by Zhang et al. from 2017. What they observed was that given a CNN and the task of image classification using stochastic gradient methods, it is possible to label or to fit any uh, random labelings of data. Um, so the model is learn not just learning, it actually generalizes. Uh, so that has a number of interesting implications. Uh, uh, results that is that given sufficiently large uh, such networks, uh, they are able to learn any a type of uh, functions of a particular form. Uh, and also given that these models may actually be rich enough to just memorize the training data. So the model is definitely learning something uh, and it is generalizing, but it's not necessarily the manner in which humans learn and generalize. Uh, so an implication uh, for that is that, so it is possible to generate uh, explanations for even models like these. Uh, it may be the case that even if we have say very accurate models, uh, they may be learning an epi epiphenomenon and so uh, when we generate explanations, try to understand a phenomenon, then how do we d distinguish uh, meaningful explanations uh, and generalizations from epiphenomenons? Uh, what is the difference between a meaningful pattern versus a pattern which is not meaningful? So with that framing in mind, uh, so now we move the discussion to activation maximization. Uh, so which is an analysis framework that searches for input patterns uh, that produce a maximum model response for whatever quantity of interest. So it may be image, it may be text, uh, depending on the model. And it's analogous to analysis of uh, individual neurons in the brain by neuroscientists. Uh, and for the same reason, it has its limitations. Uh, so as an example, so we consider a particular model, the LSTM-VIS, uh, so which is based on the interactive exploration of learned behavior of uh, hidden uh, nodes. So the use, particular use case uh, that the authors consider is uh, that they're given a particular uh, phrase and a specifically specified threshold. What are the hidden nodes which have activation greater than the threshold? Uh, and we can generalize to say phrases in the document uh, and visualize the structure of the activation and heat map. So when we visualize this, uh, so we are able to make out uh, a similar uh, quantities of interest which are highlighted. Uh, but that said, in terms of an explanation, we still don't know uh, why the activation uh, makes sense. So in that sense, this is a more of a quasi explanation than a true explanation. Uh, the salient elements which are captured by uh, such uh, visualizations, again, we don't know what is the relationship between them. Uh, and even if we were to take these explanations at their face value, then what is the right metric to use? Um, uh, so one could even say that the the main limitation is also with respect to the visualization method being employed. So sensitivity analysis is a widely used method, uh, not just within deep learning, uh, but in a lot of other domains. The main idea is to identify the most important input features uh, based on the models, uh, locally evaluated gradient, or maybe some other local uh, variant of that. Um, that could be done uh, in com conjunction with different methods. So we're looking at saliency, heat maps. Uh, in terms of an explanation, it has its limitation. Uh, we are not really describing the explanation in terms of the function itself per se, but rather a variation of it. Uh, so illustrated by the following example. Uh, so it's not that we are asking or explaining, uh, let's say if you're trying to identify a car that what makes it a car but rather what they, makes this image a car so that's where the subtle difference is to illustrate uh, consider the following example on this slide uh, so we're given an input image from the MNIST data set uh, the task is to recognize digits and so by overlaying heat maps and saliency maps so it is possible for us to identify uh, that what uh, what features may be playing a part. But that said, the limitation again here is that 
uh, the heat maps may be spatially uh, discontinuous, scattered, and it may or may not correspond to the actual cost relevant features. Uh, it could just be because of the type of sensitivity analysis being performed. Another method uh, which combines insights from decision trees works as follows. So the idea is that uh, once we have created the model, then we learn a decision tree, uh, which can be used as a proxy to clarify the specific reasons for each prediction uh, made by the CNN at the semantic level. And so what the decision tree actually does is to decompose feature representations into its constituent uh, concepts. And the explanation in this case is, uh, constitutes which parts uh, of the decision tree activate which filters for prediction and contribution of each pathway to the prediction itself. Another well-known method is the layer-wise relevant propagation or LRP. The main idea is based on the conservation principle. The idea is as follows. So we start with the output layer uh, and then we work backwards. So basically each neuron receives a share of the network output redistributed to the previous predecessors, to its predecessors in equal amount until you reach the input variable. Uh, so that's uh, there are certain scenarios in which it does not work as well, uh, especially when you have uh, architecture with, num uh, with a large number of fully connected layers. Uh, that when we are dis redistributing, then uh, it may redistribute it to too many lower rare neurons. In this section, we will focus on heat map families of problems for uh, visual interpretation. To illustrate, we start with the CIFAR 10 classification benchmark problem, where the task is to classify 32 by 32 pixel images across 10 different categories. Uh, we use a very complex network to illustrate. Uh, uh, talking about learning million parameters, 19.5 million multiply add operations to compute inference on a single image. Uh, even given with such uh, vast complexity, it is still possible to apply uh, relatively straightforward heap map based techniques to highlight uh, certain uh, activated map parts of the images uh, to generate an explanation or at least a quasi explanation. So when we talk about heat map based methods, we are not talking about a single method, but rather a families of method. Uh, so here we talk about three prominent such methods. Uh, so in sensitivity heat maps, uh, the idea is to measure the change of the class when specific pixels are changed based on partial der derivatives. Uh, so we can think of these as uh, local explanations. There's uh, the deconvolutional method or autoencoder based method, uh, which applies a convolution network uh, G to the output of another convolution network. Uh, so as you can see, very similar to how we think about autoencoders. Uh, we already talked about the level-wise relevance propagation method, uh, where the idea is based on the conversation conservation principle. Uh, it is apl actually applicable to generic architectures and not just to uh, certain specific types of networks, as was the case for the previous ones. To illustrate further, here's an example that a lot of us may already be familiar with, uh, the use of deep learning in uh, radiology. Uh, so the images that you're seeing over on the left is that of a chest radiogram with uh, a pathologically proven case of tuberculosis. Uh, the one on the right, same radiograph, but the output as uh, there's uh, overlaid with the result of a five fifth convolution layer from a Google Net TA classifier. Uh, so the color uh, red and light blue regions that we are seeing on the upper lobes, these are the areas which are activated by the deep neural network. So if these correspond to uh, the particular condition, uh, then to the domain expert, uh, that would be an indication of the problem. There are other areas within deep learning where our understanding of the underlying mechanisms uh, for visualization has not advanced as much. Uh, consider generated adversarial networks or GANs. Uh, most of you would be familiar with these um, if you've heard about uh, deep fakes uh, that is creating realistic fake Im images or videos. Uh, so that said, uh, we are still do not have an understanding with 
respect to providing explanations for how these images are uh, being generated. Uh, so we can ask questions like, how does a GAN represent our visual world internally? And if when we observe certain artifacts in the GAN, then why are we and how are they being generated? Uh, and then how do certain architectural choices affect GAN learning? Uh, that said, there has been some progress in this uh, area in in the last year or so, especially. So we will focus on one such technique uh, for GAN visualization. Uh, so we consider uh, a framework to do that. Uh, so the idea is to identify interpretable units in the form of uh, segment-based uh, network uh, dissection. So we identify certain uh, segments uh, which may correspond to, let's say, object concepts. Uh, and we can actually quantify their causal uh, effect by, let's say, we do certain interventions to control the outputs in the object. And we can examine that uh, by observing their contextual relationships between these units um, and then overlaying these uh, and then trying to make sense out of uh, these uh, quote unquote discovered objects with these new images. So now we focus on uh, the visualization methods associated with explanatory graphs. So consider a CNN. Uh, so within the explanatory graph, uh, there are multiple layers, each layer corresponding to a convolutional layer within a CNN. And so each uh, filter uh, in a convolutional layer, so may, it may represent different object parts. So for example, beaks of birds, ears uh, of, uh, let's say dogs, uh, so on and so forth. And so we can, one way to think about these is that uh, that's where the information regarding uh, different parts of the image are being compressed. Uh, think of that as a dictionary. So with the explanatory graph, so given an image, you can identify uh, a hierarchy, the, uh, like what are the different parts of the convolution network which are activated. Um, and then correspondingly, based on that, we can create an explanatory graph and that would be an explanation of well, why are we say, predicting or recognizing an object as such. A somewhat loosely associated concept is that of concept activation vectors. Uh, the idea is that given a set of examples representing a concept of human interest, so we try to find vectors in the space of activation layers that represent this concept. And then we do that by contrasting that with examples chosen from a, a concept set versus random examples. And so the way that we identify these activation vectors is with respect to if they are relative activation with respect to the set of interest versus random examples. We will talk about limits of visual interpretability in deep learning and in general limitations of the interpretability in deep learning. Visual methods for interpretability in deep learning are based today mostly on the concept of the heat map. So you have an object, uh, say in image in this uh, case uh, you see the animal and then uh, you show uh, the heat map where you identify uh, the most important uh, pixels uh, uh, called salient points or parts uh, and then uh, uh, this is uh, provided as an explanation. Uh, the question uh, is actually is uh, mm, how we can trust that it's a uh, a real explanation for the human. For the computer inference, it's actually going backward uh, in uh, the deep neural network with different uh, alternative approaches developed and finding uh, those points. And uh, different methods obviously find different uh, points and you need to figure out which one is right. So you as a human need to take a look and check, yes, that's the real case. This example illustrates uh, the idea of um, the deep learning visual um, explanations again. Um, it also illustrates the idea that most explanations in deep learning are implicit and incomplete, require, requiring a human giving meaning to salient dominant elements. Uh, here you see the boat and how you recognize that this is a boat because it has a mast. But on the same picture, there's another boat without mast. 
So you use some, need to use some other features to recognize that this is a map. So explanations in this case need to be local and case specific. So again, human need each time to recognize, okay, this one is a boat because it has a mast. This one is a boat due to some other features. Insight from adversarial learning uh, to help um, to improve uh, explanations is uh, quite good because they actually uh, provide the counter uh, examples and exploiting uh, exploiting them deliberately uh, creating creating them so localizing uh, the error possible errors and the possible explanations machine learning suffered from over generalization basically for decades and the adversarial learning can help This example illustrates uh, the uh, case because what uh, happened uh, uh, here, a panda with adding random noise actually converted to uh, another animal. Uh, so if you know such uh, cases, then you definitely can localize your explanation. Another recent attempt uh, to analyze uh, limitations uh, of uh, deep learning and uh, the advantages actually linking them with uh, physics. Uh, uh, the discoveries uh, came from uh, the fact that uh, neural networks uh, deep in deep learning uh, setting uh, favor certain classes of exceptionally simple probability distributions and able to approximate uh, polynomials highly efficient and this was matched with uh, hierarchical and compositor, uh, compositional generative process in uh, physics. It will be uh, quite interesting to see uh, how much uh, the new insight we will get from uh, physics approach uh, in uh, machine learning. Another problem for deep learning and all other machine learning is data quality and uh, abilities to overgeneralize uh, data. Uh, here are some examples uh, from uh, uh, medical exercises. Uh, such examples were known for decades, but now uh, the rate of uh, data grow quickly and uh, obviously the number of examples related to the data quality is also growing. So it's an inevitable uh, issue that is definitely a need to be addressed. So in this section, uh, we take a user-centric view of interpretability of visual methods, especially at the foundational as well as uh, practical aspects. It's also imperative to describe what constitutes user-centric interpretability. Uh, so in general, in machine learning systems, and not just for explainability, the participation of end users in the design of machine learning tools is uh, paramount uh, because the the creators of the system, uh, the designers, uh, they may actually have different end goals in mind when creating the system. And a large number of, uh, of case studies, uh, as well as uh, other evidence, uh, it's been shown that a large number of users may actually have the expectation of actionability when it comes to interpretable or explainable models, uh, which these creators of these models or the designer of even the UX systems may not be thinking about. What makes the problem of interpretability from a user's perspective complex is that you want the data that is being used, uh, they may not be unanimous agreement on the ground truth. Uh, so for example, consider the case of uh, diagnosis in radiology. A number of studies have shown that uh, even experts do not have agreement with respect to what different quantities uh, mean. Different labelings may have different meanings. Uh, and even in terms of uh, errors, uh, it's been demonstrated that uh, within a wide range, that is two to 20% of uh, ra all radiology reports contain demonstrable errors. Uh, so consider the example of the image uh, that we are observing uh, on this slide. So for the top image, uh, uh, in studies that was done, it was shown that uh, the grade of uh, this 
uh, retinopathy image uh, should be one while if you look at the bottom image so these are the results uh, from asking different uh, physicians regarding the grade uh, so although there's one mode uh, but we still do see a spread with respect to what the expert opinion is so hence the lack of agreement uh, even in terms of ground truth and also even in the real world uh, interpretations are often incomplete regardless of whether we are talking about machine learning or not uh, so different question arise so how do we make sense of cases when it's not when it's possible to explain a model without completely understanding it and there are a number of examples from physics that we can point uh, to illustrate this uh, now, so we highlighted the issue of using uh, black boxes to understand black bo boxes in certain cases especially for quasi explanations just justified but that's not always the case and what is it meaning for an explanation to be uh, complete it may or may not be uh, the case always um, so from the history of science consider kepler's law of planetary motion so based on detailed observations uh, of planets by tycho Brahe, uh, kepler promulgated his laws which provided uh, an ex quote unquote a mathematical explanation a formulation of uh, approximation of motions of planets around the sun but there was no ontological or concrete explanation in terms of why that phenomenon happens. Uh, it took more than 70 years before uh, Newton came up with the theory of gravitation, which not just explained uh, the laws of the planets, but it also explained a host of other phenomena. So here's an example of a black box explaining black boxes in case of Kepler laws and it took Newton's theory of gravitation to provide a real concrete explanation uh, rooted in ontological phenomenon. Another really interesting example from the history of science is quantum mechanics. It would be safe to quote uh, Richard Feynman to state that nobody understands quantum mechanics and yet from a predictive perspective it has proven to be the most uh, powerful theory ever devised by humans but that said from an ontological perspective if you want to root it into our everyday experience then we still cannot really answer questions like what does it mean for something to be a particle and wave at the same time uh, so another domain where there are quasi explanations but a an explanation rooted in the ontology of our everyday experience that is still missing in the earlier sections, we talked about saliency-based methods. So within the context of user-centric explanations, uh, one can ask the question, why do these methods work? Uh, so there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, so prime being, as is the case for most visual methods, they provide a visual summarization uh, of the phenomenon. Uh, additionally, they are attuned to human gaze. Uh, they tend to have low cognitive overload so easy to understand easy to comprehend and more often than not they provide a plausible justification for the prediction so complementary question that we can ask is when does saliency does not work so in the slide uh, consider the visual where the task is to score given an image of a person whether the person has lipstick on or not so you can consider the original image a pasted image where there's a prominent uh, lipstick and also when a masked image is given so if you look at the scores of all the three images even in the case of the masked case we are getting a positive score which raises the question what exactly is it that the model is learning uh, and most certainly it's not learning the quote unquote the concept of uh, wearing lipstick so let's consider another example of where saliency does not work uh, so in a lot of these saliency images uh, suppose we want to recognize say an animal uh, then more often than not the prominent parts uh, of the body of that animal are highlighted so for example beaks eyes feet so on and so forth uh, but occasionally more often than not we do find cases where uh, parts of the image are highlighted which may or may not make sense so consider these images here uh, so basically it's not always possible to assign semantics uh, given these saliency maps that said uh, there are still a number of things uh, that 
we can generalize or learn from these methods. So, but a number of studies have shown that uh, better performing deep learning models have higher proportion of deep neurons highly predictive of human gaze. Uh, so it shows that there is some similarity between uh, what uh, these models are recognizing and how humans are recognizing these images. But that again, that's not always the case. Uh, and that uh, again, more often than not, the predictive neurons are attuned to clear semantic categories, uh, which we can map onto similar human related categories. But that said, uh, there is an element of uh, forcing some of this mapping uh, from what these models are recognizing and uh, human concepts. This also hints at a potentially useful strategy uh, that is uh, saliency, at least as it is experienced by humans, uh, likely involves high level world knowledge. Uh, in addition to some low level perceptual cues. Uh, so how is this useful? Well, it could be that we could use some of this information, maybe insights from uh, neuroscience uh, psychology, uh, and maybe methods that minimize the distance between predictive saliency maps and the ground truth as recorded by human gaze. Maybe that can be used to create better models. This brings us back to a fundamental question. That is, what exactly needs to be interpretable when we interpret machine learning models? Uh, so we at this moment, so we should step back and think about interpretability as a system-wide phenomenon uh, that we are trying to to interpret not just the models but also the features, parameters, and even the insight delivery. Delivery. Uh, so it's not just the models per se, but how the models should be used. Uh, so the way to think about it is to take a satisficing approach, uh, where the idea is that the model should be. Uh, good enough uh, uh, for the task at hand uh, while also having uh, some sort of model fidelity. Uh, and to quote uh, the famous statistician uh, Box, all models are wrong, some models are useful. Uh, that said, uh, the explanation may or may not require completeness, uh, which is okay given uh, certain circumstances, given uh, certain constraints. So for, uh, and we need to take a system uh, view of interpretability, uh, as I just stated. Uh, so considering the AI or the machine learning system as a whole, in terms of features, model parameters, um, that for certain use cases, individual constituent elements of the system uh, should be interpretable. Um, and we have to take that into account uh, while also uh, taking the user's capabilities in terms of their cognitive capacity. So at the beginning of the tutorial, we talked about the Eli Pi principle. Explanation should be from the domain and the explanation granularity may vary. So if you are, say, uh, predicting if somebody will be discharged from a hospital, the explanation that you give uh, to a physician would be different from what you give that to a discharge planner. Uh, so there's a, an extra element of that. Uh, and we talk about interpretability from a systems perspective. And lastly, if we are talking about practical aspects of interpretable machine learning systems, uh, then this, this visual uh, illustrates how it fits into the larger whole. Uh, so from a now classic paper from 2015, where it shows that in terms of the actual code for machine learning models, uh, that's actually a small part of a much larger infrastructure that constitutes uh, and what is required to run machine learning models in the real world. Now we are going to discuss open problems and current research frontier to close up uh, this presentation. Many, if not most, explanations are wrong or quasi-explanations, while some explanations are useful. Requiring absolute fidelity in interpretable machine learning is unwarranted given the complexity of models involved. We need to clarify what are the good enough models that allow debugging so to get better models. Does the explanation capture the space of phenomenon to be explained or just touch it? Context and use cases determine what level of fidelity is required for explanation and obviously all these issues need to be uh, 
involved in the next uh, development. Several recent uh, studies uh, discovered that some models are actually right for the wrong uh, reason. Uh, use domain knowledge uh, to constrain explanations is one of the ways to do this. Training models uh, with input gradient penalties was uh, offered uh, in the literature. And use uh, domain knowledge to control confounding factor as explanations uh, can help also. There is an example. An algorithm could learn to look uh, at scars or medical device implants that indicate previous health problem and decide that people without this mask did not uh, have a condition. If the training data uh, really represented such cases, then such confounding factor can be easily be captured and actually happened. Evaluation of explanation of how correct uh, visual methods a uh, little bit easier than uh, when we have abstract uh, rules. Uh, let's consider this uh, situation with uh, digit 3. On the left, we have a randomly generated heat map that do not provide any interpretable information to separate 3 from other digits, say, 8 or 9. In the middle, we have a segmentation uh, heat map that shows the whole digit without relevant parts uh, for distinguishing from 8 or 9. And uh, finally, on the right, we have a relevance heat map uh, that shows parts of the image used for classification. And it reflects human intuition on differences between 3, 8, and 9, but less between 3 and 2, but it's not the major point. The major point that the human need to be here with uh, that knowledge uh, to identify if the explanation is right or wrong. So it means that explanations provided by deep learning is actually semi-explanation or half explanation because it's not um, giving the reason why, for example, the uh, first uh, mm, salient points are uh, good ones to separate 3 from 8. In fact, it's not uh, probably good to separate 3 from 8 and 9, but the low one is uh, helpful to separate uh, 3 from 8, but not from 3 from 9, and so on. How do we, valid we validate explanations if complete fidelity is not required? The interpretation must make sense within the ontology of the domain. And uh, the question is how much it makes sense uh, in, the, in the ontology need to be interpreted and clarified itself. Outside of the domain, the method needs to operate within the constraint imposed by formal method when applicable. The key words here is uh, when applicable. Uh, traditionally, uh, people uh, try to introduce constraint like uh, simple model uh, preference uh, uh, and we have seen at the beginning example when the simplest approach with the linear model not the two of them is not uh, working perfectly or not at all another issue is uh, that validation is a domain focused question can one create cross domain general method for validation if the ontology is formalized enough, then theoretically it can be derived formally similar like uh, uh, we attempt to verify the programs. But in both cases, it's uh, too optimistic to expect that very complex situations can work this way, at least uh, as of today. Our cognitive uh, limitations play a critical role in the abilities to explain machine learning models uh, using analytical or visual uh, means. Because fundamentally, explanation involves the person who or whom the explanation is uh, provided. Machine learning used in the problems where the size of data and the number of variables are too large for humans to analyze and later on maybe to get explanation and understand explanation. So what, what to do if uh, the model is too complex for humans to analyze and comprehend? 
In this case, uh, internal explanation may be impossible due to complexity of the model. An external explanation outside of the model would be incorrect because it captures only a small fraction of that complex uh, model. Uh, Peter Norvig put uh, the similar problem in the following way. Humans make decision first and then uh, they generate an explanation and that may not be the true explanation. That's the issue that needs to be resolved uh, and multiple attempts obviously are now under development and hopefully sooner or later we will have a progress in this direction significant. Cross-domain pollination has a great potential to be used in many areas. For instance, using mm, efficient image processing algorithms uh, to classify non-image uh, data uh, can be accomplished like we illustrate uh, below. In this case study, Wisconsin breast cancer data um, uh, first uh, converted to non-image data using collocated pair coordinates algorithm and then CNN algorithm used for discovering classification model in these uh, images. In this case, each image represents single uh, Wisconsin breast cancer data case. I already shown some examples where it was done. But in contrast with the previous study where each uh, point is connected with arrow and requiring very large images to represent uh, uh, those um, arrows, uh, uh, we use intensity of um, the pixels to show the order of uh, these uh, points. Figure A shows the basic of uh, CPC image design and figure B shows a more complex design uh, images where uh, we superimposed uh, image with uh, the mean images of two classes which put side by side creating double images and uh, presenting the context. The advantage of this algorithm is lossless visualization of ND cases as V images and the ability to overlay them using heat map with a salient point discovered by CNN algorithm for model explanation. Of course, I don't have much time to talk about detail of this algorithm, but we have a presentation at this uh, conference about detail of this approach. So welcome to that presentation. Explanations are only as good as the model. It's kind of a common uh, assumption. It would be strange if the model uh, explanation uh, can exceed what the model itself allows. Mm. The degree of fidelity of interpretation varies significantly for different tasks. And how do we add guards in implementation of interpretable models to ensure some trust? Can the performance of the expert decline after results from deep learning system are shown to them? Unfortunately, it can happen. Users of machine learning systems are tempted to doubt their own judgment when information from decision support system is shown. So that actually adds extra layer of uh, complexity uh, for the explanation. The fact that human accept explanation, it does not uh, fully mean that uh, it is uh, reasonable. The next big question is how to deal with extremely complex models. What should explanations for such uh, models look like? Uh, multiple attempts now on the way to visualize uh, different layers and all layers together in uh, deep learning models. Definitely it will help uh, in debugging models, improving the accuracy. Uh, however, for uh, the explanations that models uh, it still can be helpful, but much less so far it's uh, addressed this issue than uh, the improving the accuracy of the model. Hopefully, sooner or later, the progress will be there also. Now we will summarize uh, future directions. Many of future directions uh, directly um, derived from the problems which we discussed uh, before. 
And one of uh, the problems which we probably did not touch much is uh, creating simplified explainable models with prediction that human can actually understand. Even the term downgrading complex deep learning models for human to understand was produced and using and developing visual and hybrid explanation models for this uh, would be extremely useful. Uh, and again, developing explainable graph models also will help uh, with this. Uh, and uh, another one is using first order logic to build ontologies. So this will uh, increase the strengths of uh, domain uh, related uh, explanations. And uh, finally, generating models with the sole purpose of uh, explanation definitely will grow and post-training rule extraction is one of the ways to do this. Several future other directions include uh, expert in the loop, uh, rich semantic labeling of model feature that users can understand, estimating causal impact of a given feature on model prediction, using new techniques such as counterfactual probes, generalized additive models, and others. Further development, heat map visualization of CNN by gradient weighted class activation, mapping, and other methods with highlighted uh, salient image areas. Adding explainability for deep learning architecture by layer by layer specificity. So I can continue with all these uh, future directions, but it's really exciting area to see how many um, new studies uh, need to be conducted and uh, visual methods naturally find the room uh, for further development.